natural accomplishment of Western civilization is this thing called the free individual. But now that we're on the brink of, you know, the electronic uh, dispensation, exactly what we're going to do with the free individual and how that's going to look in an era where consciousness flows through a thousand portals, uh, it's not at all clear. It's not clear whether the we can somehow now carry the idea of the free individual to an even higher level where each of us will become a kind of God, Lord over our own creation, as vast in time and space, but virtual as the cosmos in which we find ourselves embedded, or whether the free individual is going to turn out to have been the problem all along, and we're going to abandon it and become some kind of socialist gas or some collectivist swarm, a hive mind, a a world where intelligence flows where needed and identity is provisional and fleeting and unanchored to place or body. I mean, much of this goes on on the Internet, you know. You can be an 11-year-old girl. You can be whatever you want. You can build your avatar and present yourself uh, uh, in many guises. It's much more like a, a shifting fantasy land than it is like the good old world of positivist rock and roll. I just wondered what the uh, connection is between the uh, singing of Shaman and Shaman and is a catalyst for the visionary experience. And uh, if, if there's any coral, corollary the much Well, yeah, I think that, you know, we see shamanism from the outside with the values of Western civilization unconsciously applied. Uh, in cultures that are taking psychedelics, this thing which we call singing is a very complicated activity indeed. And if you've ever sung on psychedelics, you know that, you know, it's an ecstatic and complicated and synesthetic experience. I mean, to, to make of your body a vibrator for sound, to, to, you know, move out into the Pythagorean octaves with the human voice and, it's extraordinary, actually. I mean, how capable of sound human beings are. No other animal has the range and control. Uh, And of course, they say, well, this is because uh, we're adapted for spoken language. But I think we had a lot of this range and control before. Um, So things, words that we use very... knowledgeably like song, ancestor spirit, power place, we're not getting 90% of the nuance of these meanings because they go so gracelessly into English. Uh, When a shaman talks about uh, spirit, he's using a term as technically complicated in his mind as when a physicist uses the term beauty to describe a quark, you know, it's a, it's very technically defined. And we tend to simplify and then suppose that we understand. Uh, part of the thing I found with hanging with shamans in various places and times is uh, that once you get past the language barrier, what shamans are are simply curious people. Uh, intellectuals of a certain type uh, in Australian Aboriginal slang a shaman is called a clever fella if someone says I'm a clever fella they mean you know I'm a shaman well that's all it is you know it's somebody who pays attention to how things actually work and sort of uh, transcends the culture by that means. It's a weird paradox. It's that the shamans, who are the keepers of the cultural values, are also necessarily of the keepers of the secrets of the theatrics 
of the cultural values. And so they live their lives in the light of the knowledge that it all rests on showbiz. It, you know, everybody else is a true believer, but these are the image makers, the people who who actually pull the strings and uh, control the evolution of the mythologies. And in a way, it's a situation of alienation. Merciliad talks a lot about this in shamanism, the archaic techniques of ecstasy, and in uh, history, the eternal return. Uh, talks about how the shaman is socially marginal, politically marginal, lives at the edge of the village, and so forth and so on, but and is feared by the people uh, because do dealings with the shaman are always dealings about life and death. But then the shaman comes forward in this critical role as go-between, as mediator between the cultural mind and the real world, which is this potent set of forces and planetary cycles and meteorological events and diseases and, you know, fate. And the shaman mediates. In many languages, the word for shaman means go-between. So the cost of this, or the price of this, for the shaman himself or herself is a kind of alienation from the cultural values and a kind of understanding that uh, it's, it's just a, it's a game that's kept in play. Uh, and this is true in our culture as well. You don't think the people who market all this crap and uh, and produce all this bad art and so forth and so on love it or watch it or consume it. They market it. Its basic purpose is to delude the and distract uh, the masses. So the psychedelics, what they bring into that shamanic situation is sort of rocket fuel for the project of cultural detoxification or Gnostic rocket fuel into a realm of cultural alienation. And then, and from that point of view, then uh, these other dimensions of reality come into being and, and deeper understanding comes into being. I mean, one of the things I think after spending a while with all this is it really helps to be educated. It really helps to cram a lot of information and experience into your head because the logos, the alien AI, the higher and hidden God that is trying to reach down to you and deliver the message is a collagist it can't really compose the message except out of bits and pieces of what you already possess. And so, you know, this would, came home to me very forcefully when I developed the time wave out of the I Ching and its sequence because at the times when I was most inflated in my thinking or most grandiose in my thinking, one of the issues for me personally was why me? You know, why are you downloading this millenarian visionary revelation on me? And the answer from the mushroom was fairly humbling. It was, you are the first person who has ever walked through this pasture who had these 64 hexagrams in your head. And that's all we needed. We were just waiting for somebody with, who could bring that much to the party. And then we could arrange the details and the mapping and the arranging. But they had to arrive with that much, and you're the first person. So it was like nothing about, you know, my fine genes or cosmic destiny, but the just I was the first termite to happen by carrying the right scrap of information in their head that this thing could uh, could then manipulate. Is that, is that something that is like clinically extracted? Well, most DMT in the underground has been synthesized from indole. 
it's a fairly simple process like third year organic chemistry. DMT does occur in nature in many plants, um, but usually there is little of it, so you have to process a lot, or it occurs complexed with other tryptamines that have various psycho and physiological activities that you don't want, and that's very difficult to separate them. So most DMT in the underground is made by underground chemists. And if any of them are listening, you, you might consider making a bit more. Uh, <laughs> because uh, it's hideously hard to come by. Uh, if you could, if you had an IND, if you had a license to give it to human subjects, but so few people have such paper that the practical answer is no. So, uh, it's like that, yeah. So, shamanic ability to manifest these miracles at a rush hour hamburger stand level? Well, aside from the story you Why mentioned... <laughs> no, no. The, the, the answer is... All, the truthful answer is always complicated, although the truth itself is always simple. Um... If you're asking to me to tell a story of a miracle that I still cherish as authentic, um, I don't think it's told in True Hallucinations, the book, because it involved, well, you'll soon see why, but here's an incident that happened at La Cherera that didn't make it into the invisible landscape, I don't believe. Uh, Dennis had had this notion of what he called the good shit. This developed in the days after the ideas about hypercarbolation. And he claimed it was like a fantasy, it was like a joke, it wasn't clear exactly what it was, but it was this idea that there was this hash somewhere that had been rolled into cow dung, and uh, cut with cow dung and then infected with psilocybin mycelium so that the mycelium had completely replaced the cow shit in this ball of hash or this hypothesized kilos of hash somewhere in the world. And and so there was this psilocybinated, uh, the good shit, and at one point he at one point he envisioned us actually forming a rock and roll band which would play instruments that would condense this stuff out of the air over large audiences and you know we would go on tour and at the end of the tour history would be the whole thing would be in a shambles because the uncle john's band really did come out of the woodwork but so at one point he predicted one night after he had been moved to the river and was sort of in semi incarceration, he predicted uh, that the good shit would come that night. And um, by this time he was very suspect. I was highly suspect. Everybody in the expedition was polarized against everybody else, and it was a pretty uptight scene. And so I left with my girlfriend of the time, and and I, it may have even been the same night as the Silver Key incident, uh, and it was pouring rain, and we made our way um, like a quarter mile, half a mile back into the jungle to this other place where we were staying, where the original experiment had been done. And so then we get to the hut, and it's pouring rain, and I had uh, scored this uh, kilo of Santa Marta gold for the expedition. And we had smoked nothing but this, for Colombia, relatively reg weed for weeks. So I got it out to roll the evening's joint. And uh, 
and I was fumbling with it, and I got this thing lit, and this little, this little crumb, this little burning thing fell on the floor, and I uh, lifted it up and uh, smelled it, and uh, <laughs> you know, the transubstantiation had occurred. It was, you know, like Mazari Sharif, triple A, red lion, hashish of some sort. And I know hashish. I, and here we were in the center of the Amazon, uh, in this hut, in this pouring rain. And I could tell that it was the good. It was the good shit. It, it had actually manifest. And I showed the woman who was with me, who was easily led one way or another, but anyway, she didn't say it wasn't, and uh, I I stayed up late that night smoking this incredible hash and waiting for the rain to stop so that at the first gray light of dawn, I could go down to the river and confound my critics with, you know, the stone itself, the alchemical quintessence, the concrescence, the excreta bonum, the good shit. Here it was. <clears throat> and so as dawn broke and the fog lifted, I made my way across this rainy pasture uh, and sat down by the hammock of the sleeping form of my most vociferous critic and sort of elbowed her awake and... Uh, you know, there were other instances where this was the principle at work. It what it didn't work. Everything had returned to normal. I it was the Cinderella screw up. You know, it was just that I was a char girl who washed pots, and there was no prince, and there was no coach, and there was no, and and plus I was once again humiliated in the presence of my critics who had further reason to think that, that a, you know, a check into the local mental health care delivery.